Reverend Fathers, esteemed colleagues, it's an honor to give the last talk at this marvelous convenio. I've been impressed and edified by the insightful interventions presented over the last two days. The Angelicum and the Thomistic Institute are to be commended for the exceptional effort of putting this conference together. I know the efforts of TI are percolating all over the world. I see it in their constant engagement with my co college students on my own campus, in their online presence, and in their new initiatives having to do with Rome. I'm grateful for their witness and for their strenuous efforts to communicate the insights of our common doctor. I'm also deeply thankful for the Order of Preachers as a whole, a group that I've dedicated my scholarly career to studying. My impressions have been confirmed this week, particularly at moments of repast and conviviality, that the Dominican way is the true path, where, to quote the poet, one may fatten well if he does not stray. The speaker of Dante's poem is, of course, our own St. Thomas. We meet him in the tenth circle of Paradiso as the narrator of the story of Francis of Assisi. Yet the brilliant poet uses Thomas as much more than a mouthpiece for Minorite virtue. In a wider sense of the divine comedy, he is a foil to Ulysses, who we encountered in Inferno 26. The wandering Greek seeks to travel the world, finding out about men's vices and their worth. In doing so, he causes the death of all of his sailors, foundering in his quest in the very shadow of the mountain of purgatory. His vana curiositas has led him from the search for immortal glory to a nameless, watery grave. Thomas, on the other hand, represents studiositas. Why, might one ask, does Dante make Thomas embody only a potential or secondary part of the virtue of temperance? A rather inglorious representation, it would seem. But Ulysses and Thomas are hinges of the poem. Ulysses represents the immoderate aspirations of natural humanity at its best, for all men desire to know. To his credit, he subordinates his bodily appetites to his deeper inclination in order to achieve what he seeks. Dante skirts on the edge of admiration for this character, who has never ceased to resonate with the poem's readers. Yet the Greek captain is ultimately disordered in his search. We can identify in the poet's description of Ulysses all the ways that St. Thomas lists as a moderate in his analysis of the, vein, of, the, of the vice of curiosity. He is prideful in his search. He spurns his obligations in order to pursue vain knowledge. He consorts with lesser spirits to attain it. He declines to refer his knowledge of creatures to their proper final end. And most especially, at the base of the mountain of purgatory, he seeks to know naturally what can only be discerned through revelation. Thomas, on the other hand, incarnates the virtue that moderates his highest natural desire and orders it correctly. Studiousness is a directive habit for those who have to a certain extent attained the other moral virtues in that it enables the intellectual virtues to mature and flower. It is a mediating characteristic between body and soul and a gateway to higher perfection. Thomas remains at the center of the wheel and in the center he can see much farther than the storm-tossed Ulysses whose vision wis uh, witnesses only the speedy blurred circumference. Thomas embodies the words of Picarda at the base of Paradiso that so puzzle modern readers. En la sua voluntade, en nostra pace. In his will is our peace. Yet I think we can go even further in interpreting Dante's Thomas. In Paradiso 10, one finds a figure at the center of a pantheon of faithful intellectuals who is, at the same time, a paragon of the regular life. It is well known that, in purely secular terms, for Dante, Ulysses is the anti-Aeneas. Pious Aeneas will never be swayed by any temptation in achieving the fated dominion of Rome. Ulysses is the wily one, the liar and the swindler, while Aeneas is upright and plain-spoken. The poet nearly always has a religious and a secular analog, one of the most controversial, making Cato the Younger into a sort of secular Christ. I believe Dante wants us to consider Thomas as a religious analog to Aeneas. In spite of endless travels and tribulations, both Thomas and Aeneas never stray from the decree of God to achieve their ends, 
respectively the establishment of sacred and secular Rome. There is even an analogy in the young Thomas's driving away of the prostitute and Aeneas' treatment of Dido, though it is on an incomparably higher plane of virtue. Thomas's tears at the Compline anthem, Media Vita, in the midst of life we are in death, echoes the famous lacrime sunt rerum of Aeneas. This world is a world of tears, and the burdens of mortality touch the heart. Yet Thomas, like Aeneas, eventually finds a haven, a foundation from which to accomplish the great things laid out by divine providence. From that haven, Thomas was able to achieve the learned leisure, or otium, that is necessary for sustained intellectual effort. Indeed, as I will later, ar later argue, the Dominican rule is one of the finest institutional solutions for the extension of otium in as broad and equitable a manner as possible, while at the same time respecting natural hierarchies of talent and intelligence. The results speak for themselves. Father Mondonet once made a back-of-the-envelope calculation, but one that is absolutely telling. He said that if one added up the literary and intellectual contributions of the order between 1220 and 1350, it was greater than the output of all human societies in every period of human history up to that point put together. The sheer achievement of the first Dominican century was a stunning triumph of the human mind, all made possible by the genius of the institutional order created by Dominic. In this effort, Thomas was the tip of the iceberg. The treasures of this era are still being excavated by patient scholars, though alas, fewer and fewer today. Thomas was also aided by his historical situation. There was no major church-disturbing heresy during his period of academic output like Arianism in the 4th century or Protestantism in the 16th. He did not have to put the bulk of his intellectual endeavors into combating it. The major medieval heterodoxy, Catharism, was then being pushed to the margins of European society and extinguished by his own brethren. Thus, Thomas was free to live and to think through his comprehensive theology, ex corde ecclesiae, at the heart of the church. In this, he was much like Augustine who lived after the Trinitarian controversies, but died just before the rise of the great Christological questions. Except for some pesky Donatists and Pelagians, Augustine was free to map out a comprehensive theology that was not fundamentally controversial. Though he and Thomas both engaged in many intellectual battles, providence granted a space for these thinkers that permitted them to be wide-ranging in their interests and profound in their meditations. Thomas was also the beneficiary of a series of cultural contexts that enabled, that enabled him to be the good man who out of his good treasure brings forth good things. He is the very embodiment of the idea that privilege is not intrinsically the problem. It is what one does with it. He was indeed to the manner born, to an aristocratic family that blended the martial tradition of his father's Lombard blood with the cosmopolitan society of the Sicilian nobility drawn from his mother. Throughout his life, he demonstrated all of the good characteristics that one associates with aristocracy, with none of its attendant defects. In all his dealings, he displayed a heroic patience and forbearance. Thomas was a man who could suffer fools gladly. In an age that hurled polemics like projectiles, the common doctor never lowered himself to the level of insult. Even his controversial works are tranquil though Paris often boiled around him. Poor David of Denant, qui stultissime posuit deum esse materium primam, is the one exception that proves the rule. <laughs> Given the even temper one finds in all the masters writing, the contempt inherent in this assertion shocks us, but its singularity reminds us of how truly charitable Thomas was in all his endeavors. This characteristic deepened spiritually, when the young Thomas was sent to study at Monte Cassino among the Benedictines. There he was inserted into the monastic orarium. For nearly a decade, he lived a hidden life, immersed in both the constant repetition of the sacred texts and in the rudiments of the trivium, which he mastered with speed and ease. His formation, unlike nearly all of his confreres, parallels that of St. Dominic. Both sons of rural, well-off families they were rooted in a stability that many later Dominicans never knew. Before the preaching in Languedoc, 
Dominic had been contentedly living the life of a reformed Augustinian canon, praying the divine office and observing the customs of the monastery. Most of the other friars had come from the busy, burgeoning cities and had converted directly from the hustle and bustle of the schools. Such background certainly stood them in good stead for wandering preaching and intellectual combat, but it was the experience of rock-solid stability that grounded both Dominic and Thomas in a special way. Thomas was as happy in silence as he was in the turbulence of an academic career. Indeed, as Joseph Pieper says, he belonged to that race of men whose imposing calm grows in proportion to the noise and tumult around. He demonstrated these characteristics during his family-imposed imprisonment. They were mightily irritated at Thomas's affiliation with the friar's preachers, not so much because of its poverty, but because of its enmity with the Emperor Frederick II, with whom the family was aligned. For that offense, he was abducted and incarcerated by them for almost a year and a half. You don't have family problems, Thomas did. Here we first see Thomas redeeming the time. He betrayed no annoyance with the conditions imposed upon him. It is, after all, difficult to imprison a hermit. Thomas had all he really needed, silence and books. For an intellectual, how valuable it is to have a space to think, privacy, and access to literature. Perhaps he recalled this as he wrote in his commentary about the phrase, redeem the time, in Colossians 4. Quote, act wisely and with wisdom, for God loves nothing so much as the man who lives with wisdom. The reason for doing this is that they may be making the most of the time. A person makes the most of his trouble when he overlooks what is owed to him in order to avoid trouble. Now, the Christians were being troubled by these outsiders, and so Paul wants them to make the most of this trouble by means of wisdom, maintain good conduct among the Gentiles. Were his family the Gentiles? Perhaps. How appropriate that the ordinary gloss for this passage says that one must make time to preach, and in the absence of opportunities for preaching, to prepare for preaching. In his unshakable commitment to the order, Thomas was doing just that, so steadfast was his example that he not only drew two of his sisters into the religious life, but by the time of his release, the whole family had switched allegiance from the empire to the papacy. Paul uses identical language in Ephesians 5. Thomas also comments on this passage, but gives it a different valence, one that speaks to his commitment to the new order. Now we have to redeem the time because the days are evil. We must avoid the depravity of the days. To do this, we must renounce even certain things which are lawful. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. In this way, a person permits something that is rightfully his to be forfeited. <clears throat> Thomas goes on to explain how one becomes wise in redeeming the time by structuring everything with respect to the final end. Quote, that man is called wise in an absolute sense who puts everything into perspective. As a wise architect, I have laid the foundation. For the role of the wise man is to put things into order. Here is one of Thomas's favorite quotations, occurring no fewer than 11 times in his works, taken from the philosopher, which he made into a guiding principle of his own life. All through the term of his confinement, he had been, confront, uh, he'd been comforted by the elderly Dominican, John of San Giuliano, one of only two friars then left in Naples. We know nothing about him other than that he visited Thomas, bringing him books and a new habit, patiently cultivating the young man's vocation. He is one of the hidden presences in the history of Thomas, who comes to us through a cloud of similar witnesses who preceded accompanied and followed him in the order. It was in the order he found not only a home, but an outlet for his intellectual life. It was not poverty that drew him, as some have claimed in the past. Rather, it was because among the friars, he could see every obstacle to his intellectual vocation removed and a path cleared to the way of contemplation and to the most effective communication of that contemplation to others. As Jacques de Vitry said of the young order, it was the sancta et honesta Christi Scholarium Congregatio, the holy and learned congregation of Christ's scholars. 
Quickly, Thomas had outstripped both his Benedictine teachers at Monte Cassino and the masters at the Young University of Naples. Only through the order could he be apprenticed to the finest minds of the age and to attain that most precious pearl of medieval academic life, study at the University of Paris. Here we come to two essential backgrounds that nurtured St. Thomas, the school and the city. Their symbiotic relationship formed an environment in which the preachers thrived. From the beginning, they were an urban movement, ministering to the flourishing cities of Europe and aiding a secular clergy that was largely unprepared for the influx of such a multitude. Most of the early Dominicans were from the rising middle class. They were spiritual entrepreneurs who paralleled the mercantile classes they served. The coalition between friars and burghers propelled both the Franciscans and Dominicans to unprecedented prominence in the 13th century, siphoning off resources from established parishes and institutions, much to the chagrin of the local presbyterate. Yet the laity embraced the new orders with gusto, not only contributing their money, but affiliating themselves to confraternities and charities run by the friars. In a certain sense, the D Dominicans were the spiritual bourgeoisie, in a deeply Christian world that was, for the first time, generating significant amounts of wealth, guilt could run deep. The new orders provided a way to spiritually launder the abundance of revenue for both the common good and for the individual salvation of the believer. In a world where the traditional model of fighters, clerics, and peasants was completely breaking down, the Dominicans blazed a path whereby the life of the mind and the exercise of what would come to be called white-collar work was defended and established as legitimate. The new middle class, increasingly literate, called for deeper and more learned levels of spiritual engagement, something the preachers were prepared to supply. The commotion of commerce went hand in hand with the activity of the friars in the busy streets. These often alighted in a public way when the open piazzas of the marketplace became the setting for charismatic Dominican preaching. While the friars had pitched their tent in the midst of the urban world, their convents provided a contemplative respite that summoned the merchants and bankers to the particularly Dominican hour of Compline at the close of the business day. Such a base of operations allowed the friars, in the tradition of the canons they descended from, the opportunity for a wide-ranging public ministry in the day and a quasi-monastic contemplation at its close. The concentration of population in the cities had occasioned the rise of schools, and finally the innovation of the university, one of the most remarkable achievements in all of human history. From the beginning, the Dominicans were made for the schools. All their energies were bent upon them, seeing higher learning not as an end in itself, but as a means to quench the thirst for souls felt so keenly by their founder. When Dominic dispersed his brethren in 1217, he knew exactly where to send them to the twin academic centers of Bologna and Paris, soon to become the axis of the whole order. From the earliest days, priories were designed to be schools as well as monasteries. No convent was to be found without a lector whose responsibility was to offer classes to provide a sort of permanent formation for all the friars. The constitutions were designed in such a way as to prioritize teaching and learning. Wide powers of dispensation eventually gave way to customs that allowed remarkable latitude for students and professors alike. Never had there been a religious institute in the history of the church that permitted such astonishing latitude to members. Yet the purpose for this was clear. Everything was to be subordinated to the final ends of the order. The reason for the dedication to the schools was so that the fruits of contemplation could be made known. But Thomas and his brothers upset the whole monastic spiritual model that for a thousand years had made content the contemplative life superior to the active. In question 40 of the Tertia Pars, Thomas claims for Christ himself the embodiment of perfection that consisted in contemplation made effective in preaching and teaching. The incarnation itself becomes the form of the Dominican charism whereby the inner life of the Trinity is made known through the assumption of human nature by the second person. For Thomas, it is not just any activity that qualifies the mixed life as the most sublime, but only one that manifests itself in teaching and preaching, whereby the mysteries gained in contemplation are passed on to enkindle the whole world. <laughs>
This is because, as he argues in De Veritate, such activity stands with one foot in the contemplative life with the other in the active. It is the connective tissue, as it were, between the two. The path of a Dominican then is most fully Christ-like because it is most fully incarnational. This worldview was reinforced by his aggressive attempts to understand and incorporate Aristotle, whose anthropology and epistemology he was convinced could provide a stronger philosophical foundation for Christian orthodoxy than did contemporary Neoplatonism. As Chesterton says, quote, St. Thomas was making Christendom more Christian in making it more Aristotelian. This is not a paradox, but a plain truism, which can only be missed by those who may know what is meant by an Aristotelian, but have simply forgotten what is meant by a Christian. While he likely started his study of the philosopher at the University of Naples, it was the decision of the order to send him to Paris to study under Master Albert that was the true turning point. Albert's comprehensive, though not always successful, attempts to understand the Staggerite anchored the young man, who spent the rest of his life not only producing some of the most significant theological work of all time, but added to his burden by undertaking a comprehensive study of the philosopher. This grounding in Aristotelian thought, in the epistemological humility of the senses, and in direct confrontation with the reality of existence, helped to make the common doctor truly common. As I prepared these remarks, I find myself turning time and again to another Thomas, this time T.S. Eliot, to help explain this phenomenon. Because I know that time is always time, and place is always and only place, and what is actual is actual for only one time and for only one place, I rejoice that things are as they are. As Chesterton again remarked, Thomas, quote, stands in the broad daylight of the brotherhood of men, in their common consciousness that eggs are not hens or dreams or mere practical assumptions, but things attested by the authority of the senses, which is from God. There is an is. That is as much monkish credulity that St. Thomas demands of us from the outset. With his apprenticeship to Albert in 1245, he begins the public proportion of his career. He was to have fewer than 30 years. By the time he became a master, there were fewer than 20. One wonders if there was ever a thinker who so thoroughly redeemed the time. It seems he never brooked his efforts or banked his fires. Once again, the Thomas of the 20th century gives an insight to the Thomas of the 13th. The point of intersection of the timeless with time is the occupation of a saint. No occupation either, but something given and taken in a lifetime's death in love. And so the young man set himself to his tasks. Though Albert was to grow fond of him, he did not spare him work. The German master, as a keen mentor, gauged the young man's talents and burdened him accordingly. More and more he added to Thomas's plate, and he increasingly came to rely on him as an associate. During the late 1240s, Thomas was undertaking his own studies, tutoring other students, practicing disputations, preparing for ordination, and serving as Albert's teaching assistant. A dumb ox indeed, but one who would plow further and deeper than any of the others, head down and with determination. He embodied the old Dominican saying that the wood of one's desk is the wood of one's cross. He was aided by his ability to concentrate and penetrate to the deepest sense of texts. Even his master's interest in empirical science could not distract him from the sacred page. As Simon Tugwell has said, Thomas was profoundly uninterested in the world around him, except in as much as it contained books and people. It must be candidly admitted that sometimes the former took priority. And yet his entire life was dedicated to the passing on of knowledge. For him, wisdom was not a good to possess, but one to live out and give away. It was diffusive of itself. From his very earliest days, he showed a special love for his pupils. His fellow students, when his intellect became known, flocked to him for tutoring, a service which he devoted himself to unstintingly. It was for these qualities that Albert proposed Thomas for the position of bachelor at Paris in 1251. Even given his acknowledged skills, this nomination is shocking. 
First, at only 26 years old, he was below the requisite age of 29, stipulated by the constitutions of the masters. Further, the order was aware that a war was brewing at the university between seculars and mendicants. It is a testament to Albert's foresight that he considered the young man suitable to commence his career under such circumstances. Thomas took this opportunity to begin his master work, the commentary on the sentences. He did this while doing cursory biblical commentary on the prophetical books and writing to Antiatacensia for his fellow preachers. Though such a workload was heavy, it paled in comparison to what he would later be able to accomplish. Yet the young scholar would not be left in peace long. Academic unrest was roiling the university. Of course, one could ask whether this is not ever not the case, but there are ebbs and flows in academic unrest. A debate was then coming to a head in the numbers of chairs. In 1250, there were 12 chairs that made up the Consortium of Theology Masters. The Franciscans held one, the Dominicans held two. Nine belonged to the other professors, but three were reserved ex officio to the canons of Notre Dame. This left the secular masters with only six. Since most business had to be transacted with the two-thirds majority, the religious could often unbalance the secular professors and obstruct university legislation. In 1252, the faculty of the theology, uh, the theology faculty issued a statute to deprive the Dominicans of their second chair, one that, to be honest, was constitutionally hazy. I'm not gonna lie. Meanwhile, violence had again broken out between students and the Parisian authorities in the heady carnival atmosphere of 1253. A student had been killed and others imprisoned in violation of rights guaranteed by papal edicts. As it happened in the past, the masters declared a strike. As it happened in the past, the mendicants refused to comply. For this, they were expelled from the consortium of masters. The new orders were still beloved by the papacy and Innocent IV immediately ordered their reinstatement. The masters flatly refused. First, because it was contrary to a previous papal ruling, not to mention a violation of their corporate freedom. When a university official appeared at Saint-Jacques to post the consortium's refusal, he was physically assaulted by Dominican novices and given a bloody nose. Thomas was present for all these festivities. The seculars decided to make an appeal to all of Christendom and sent an encyclical letter in 1254 defending their position. These scholars spent their whole lives at the university becoming identified with its mission, meaning the supply of chairs, was radically limited for promising secular students. On the other hand, the mendicants matriculated masters like a supermarket checkout line. They obtained their degree, taught a few years, and bolted to the convents of the order. Of course, for the Dominicans, this is a feature, not a bug. It meant that students who affiliated with the order had much greater opportunity to achieve higher degrees and to obtain academic employment. It did, on the other hand, often make them bad academic citizens seemingly mooching off the prestige and, scholarship and solidarity of the institution that had educated them. The seculars recognized two things. First, they needed a new tactic to take the edge off the widely popular mendicants, and second, they needed to go through the Pope. This was a war of competing papal privileges. The seculars had painted themselves into a corner. Whatever happened would have to happen at the Curia. To that end, they appointed the secular master, William of Saint-Amour, as their proctor. They discovered new ammunition with the, production, with the publication of the Introduction to the Eternal Gospel by an anonymous mendicant, later found to be Gerald of San, uh, Borgo San Donino. The historian C.H. Lawrence remarked that this, quote, essay in millennial fantasy dropped into the Paris dispute with the explosive force of a bomb falling into a quarrelsome duck pond. The book was inspired by the mystic Joachim of Fiore, and it prophesied the coming of a third age of the spirit in 1260 that would see the disappearance of ecclesiastical laws and of the church itself in favor of the spiritual mendicants who would be the avatars of a new type of simplified and purified Christianity. They would sing a new church into being, I suppose. William quickly published a critique and marched to the papal curia. The Franciscans panicked and capitulated. The Dominicans were left to stand on their own. Then events took an unforeseen turn. William not only denounced the eternal gospel, but condemned the mendicant orders wholesale. Innocent IV, who had long been a partisan of the orders, was nearing the end of his life. Almost overnight, the Pope turned against them. In Etsy on Amarum of 21 November 1254, the mendicants were repudiated. They were stripped of nearly all of their privileges, patiently gained over 30 years. 
This went far beyond the university and affected the very existence of the new orders. Had innocent lived longer, they would have been a serious effort to suppress the mendicants wholesale. The leadership of the preachers ordered litanies and penitential psalms prayed in all the convents of the order. Within two weeks, Innocent IV was dead, leading to the quip, beware the litanies of the preachers. By the end of the year, Alexander IV, a friend of the orders, had been elected. By April, he had suspended et Sianamarum. How much can change in the blink of an eye and transition to a new pontiff? Under the brilliant leadership of the Master General Humbert of Romans, the Dominicans righted the ship. But having tasted success, the secular masters did not relent. While the taverns of Paris echoed with anti-mendicant songs, William published an influential tract called The Perils of the Last Days. It seems he too was being seduced by millennial apocalypticism. One person not seduced was Thomas Aquinas. All through the tumult, he patiently continued his labor. While the secular masters roared up and down Europe, he toiled in silence. While royal archers ringed his convent in order to protect his brothers, Thomas abided. He prospered in his work so well that in February of 1256, he was certified to receive his license, four years short of the age stipulated by the constitutions. Alexander IV, in an act of papal supremacy, commanded that Thomas be given the license. It seems he was quite upset by this. Several witnesses testified. One can understand why. Such a high-handed elevation alienated nearly all his peers. Undoubtedly, some scholars of the requisite age were probably passed over to accommodate Alexander's move. So Thomas was made a master. None of the secular professors came to the solemn event to receive him as an equal with the kiss of peace. He would not be admitted to the Corporation of Masters until over a year had elapsed. His first task as Regent Master was to compose his Contra Impugnantes, his defense of the mendicant orders. The incipit is telling. Lo, your enemies have made a noise, and those who hate you have lifted up their heads. They have taken malicious counsel against your people and have consulted against your saints. They have said, come, let us destroy them so that they be not a nation, and let the name of Israel be remembered no more. Of course, we don't use that psalm in the liturgy anymore. It's too naughty. There are a few professors who have had to begin their careers defending their very right to teach, not to mention withstanding attacks on their manner of religious profession. The situation of the new orders was balanced on a knife's edge. They existed solely at the pleasure of the current pope, a pleasure that could be retracted at a moment's notice as they founded their chagrin in 1254. It was Thomas who provided the grounding that embedded the orders within the living stream of scripture and tradition, and who provided an incarnational foundation that wove the orders into the warp and woof of Christianity itself. It was no mean feat for a 30-year-old, and it comes to it as a shock to those of us deep in the Thomistic tradition that for nearly a century, this was considered by his brothers to be his most fundamental contribution. To them, he had done nothing less than save the Dominican charism. Deftly using William's own arguments against him, he makes clear the right of religious to appropriate remuneration and defends their intellectual work. In doing so, he elevates the dignity of all labor that is not manual, ironically safeguarding William's own right to a paid teaching position. He argues it is not only they who work with their hands who live by a trade, but the architect who directs their labor. Now the man who teaches morals is, so to speak, the architect of all human duties. Having secured the right to adjust compensation, he, defend, he expands his defense much more broadly, upholding the entirety of the Dominican life, their appeals to papal protection, their service in the inquisitions, and their ministry to the public. He then undertakes the trickiest job of all, to articulate the mendicant conception of the mixed life against those who saw only a dichotomy between the active and the contemplative. He accomplishes this by an extended exposition on the excellence of preaching, calling it the noblest of ecclesiastical functions. By making an exegesis that points to preaching as the purpose of Christ coming into the world. It is Christ and the apostles who provide the model for the mixed life. We should pause to see how revolutionary this is. A century before, the claim that itinerant preaching in poverty was a superior form of life was seen as frankly heretical. It upset the monastic paradigm, 
Dominic and Francis had established the practical orthodoxy of such a position. Now Thomas was providing the theoretical background that would advance the claim that such a mixed life was in itself superior, even to one that was purely contemplative. In this, he was both original and provocative, going beyond both Benedict and Aristotle in subordinating pure contemplation to the good of souls. At the conclusion of the work, Thomas was forced to deal with the millennial accusations aired by William, who asserted a novel ecclesiology that saw only bishops and, and pastors as successors of the apostles. William alleged that the mendicants were the penetrantes domos, a favorite trope about the friars from 2 Timothy. These are men who creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, and carried away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never attaining the knowledge of the truth. These, as St. Paul tells us, are heralds of the last days. William thus rather ironically began to echo the millennial ravings of the eternal gospel. Perhaps he too was swayed by the coming of the fateful year 1260. Thomas's treatment of time here was masterful, turning the Joachite panic into a tool to defeat his enemies. By careful analysis of the tradition, he understood the last times as past, present, and future together. As Eliot wrote, restoring through a bright cloud of tears the years, restoring with a new verse the ancient rhyme, redeem the time, redeem the unread vision in the higher dream. The young professor brought a renewed balance to the tortured question, restoring a sobriety that had been sorely lacking in all other contemporary polemics. He made a deep exegesis of the use of time in the scriptures, particularly as it related to the last day. Concurring with the sentiment of the fathers, he agreed that we are in the sixth or last age of this world. While this would seemingly vindicate a historicist Joachimite reading that saw the apocalyptic events described in the New Testament as transpiring over the course of church history, he diffused it in two ways. He established that the events of Matthew 24 have been recurring since the dawn of the Christian church. They are signs we are living in the last age, but are not indicators of the final days themselves. In addition, vices and heresies have flourished since the dawn of Christianity, also indicating that we are in a final period of history, yet still no man knows the day or the hour. In fact, by employing this strategy, he turned Joachitism against the seculars. He argued that anyone who used such passages to identify contemporary events was in a sense special pleading for a particular cause against the great tradition of interpretation and against the plain sense of scripture. He defangs the historicist interpretation that fueled so much unorthodoxy from Joachim to Wycliffe to the early Protestant movement. While he patiently answered each one of William's contentions, one gets the sense by the end of it that the arguments of the seculars were not tried and found wanting. They were tried and found uninteresting. A contention that turned out to be more devastating than the most vituperative polemical attack would have been. By 30 years old, Thomas had become the champion of the Dominican life. Arguments against the orders went underground. He would have to resume his advocacy again in 1268 as many of the old controversies again gained currency at the University of Paris, but the situation had stabilized. Following the burdensome and increased and occasionally ugly events that accompanied his appointment as region master, Thomas was able to have some modicum of calm, though the conditions under which he worked seemed to have little effect either on his output or its quality. It is clear that he was comfortable laboring on no fewer than three levels at once. First, the tasks that concerned his office as professor, lectures for the classes he was teaching, or questions he was disputing, not to mention the extensive expert consultations he conducted. At the same time, he was engaged on his higher level work. First, the commentary on the sentences, then the Summa Contra Gentiles, and finally the Summa Theologiae. Lastly, there was what one could call a private interest a series of comprehensive commentaries on the extant Latin Aristotelian corpus, something demanded neither by occupation nor order. These would prove critical in setting the philosophical tone of the Western world. These three distinct projects were not done in sequential order. They came into being simultaneously. During the period of his highest activity, the Second Regency in Paris, his writing covers nearly 4,000 pages the equivalent of 12 pages of type text per day of densely argued philosophy and theology. If this seems superhuman, it's because it nearly was. Within two years of finishing his term, the master would be dead. <laughs>
There was not a moment to waste in Thomas's life. With apologies to Lin-Manuel Miranda, it seems that it was Thomas Aquinas who wrote like the man who was running out of time. In order for this kind of prestigious, uh, prodigious effort to take place, dispositions were needed on both the side of the academic and on the side of the order. We've seen some of the qualities that made him able to undertake such achievements, but there's a few more that manifested themselves during his mature period. Besides his heroic sense of calm, he had another virtue that was critical for an academic, intellectual fortitude. A calm bearing did not mean that he shied away from fights. He was the leading figure of the most contentious intellectual movement of the century, the appropriation of Aristotle and his interpreters. Inured to and suffused with the teaching of the common doctor as we are, we tend to forget how strange and dangerous this was. Thomas was a radical, though different from the radicals of today, since he came to the new teaching from the heart of orthodoxy. He certainly was no cultural revolutionary. Unlike men of more limited vision, he saw the potential of the novel learning to undergird and defend the faith. Ranged against him was the whole academic orthodoxy of his day, including his Franciscan brethren. Few indeed were his professional friends. The theology faculty was dead set against him. His own bachelor would not follow all of his theses. After his death, it was not the Dominicans who maintained his teachings, but a lone young Augustinian named Giles of Rome, who promptly became a whipping boy for the consortium. One should study the early history of Thomism. Victory was far from assured. All through this, Thomas battled with dignity and courtesy. Yet he was not above raising the tone of his voice, particularly when he considered professional ethics to have been breached, as in his famous challenge to the artist to meet him in open debate, rather than whispering disputed theories to students in corners. Yet there's a third and final leavening characteristic of Thomas's academic engagement that balances tranquility and fortitude and is a critical component for anyone trying to live the life of the mind in holiness, and that is intellectual charity. Like all his scholastic colleagues, he lets his adversaries speak first, allowing them to provide their strongest arguments and then courteously answers each one in turn. He is consistently student-oriented, never blaming them for failures, but rather searching his own teaching to see what can be improved. The entirety of the Summa Theologiae is a pedagogical exercise to reorient medieval theological education in order to make it more approachable and intelligible to the student. He was unfailingly patient and courteous in correspondence. As a singular example of his charity, during his second regency, he found himself personally attacked in front of the whole university during the inception lecture of the Franciscan John Peckham. He withstood the assault with dignity and composure in spite of the remonstrances of his Dominican students. It was only at the more private resumption during the second day that he quietly and dispassionately dismantled Peckham's arguments. This threefold virtue of Thomas made him a great academic, patience, bravery, and above all, love. As Joseph Pieper says in this regard, love of truth and love of men, only the two together constitute a teacher. Thomas Aquinas was absolutely convinced that God could be found in a classroom. He also possessed the spirit of prompt obedience. He focused on this virtue as the chief of the religious vows, contrary to the Minorite emphasis on poverty. I argue it was this position that propelled him to canonization in 1323 when it was noticed and promoted by Pope John XXII. Once again, Thomas builds up an Aristotelian definition into a religious principle. It is not a far cry from the true academic who conforms his mind to the truth, to the true religious, who bound his will to a superior for the sake of virtue. He knew that it was the truth that set us free, and not we who are free to set the truth. His mind was like a refiner's fire. Everything it received, it gave back in equal measure, yet incalculably purified and elevated. He simply surrendered his whole life to the purposes of the order. Whatever they needed, he responded. One episode demonstrates that clearly. After his triumphant first regency at Paris ended in 1259, he returned home to his Roman province for the first time in over a decade. Because of his victory, he received numerous honors and privileges over the next several years. Then at the provincial chapter of 1261, something strange happened. He was assigned to the backwater convent of Orvieto, far from any center of learning or culture. Past writers have been impressed by the later residence of Pope Urban IV in the city, thinking that Thomas was receiving a signal honor in being appointed to the papal city. 
There's a serious chronological problem with that. Urban was then in Viterbo and made no indication of moving to the Umbrian Hill City till the end of 1262, more than a year after Thomas's appointment. When the master arrived to take up his duties as conventual lector, there were likely no more than several thousand people living in the city. The friar's convent, though one of the earliest, was also one of the least prestigious. Far from his brilliant students at Paris, the friars who remained at San Domenico were not even considered suitable for study at the provincial level. They were fratres communes, who needed practical uh, education necessary for preaching and hearing confessions. Yet he dove into his teaching with zeal. Indeed, it was in instructing such fratres communes that he developed his pedagogical theories about the shortcomings of theological education. It was there the seeds of the Summa were planted. Though by the end of 1262, Orvieto had become one of the thriving intellectual centers of Christendom, it bore no such promise at first. That the papal curia arrived and in its train some of the most brilliant minds of Europe was pure serendipity. In his activity, both Thomas and the order were a match made in heaven. The wise prescriptions of the Dominican constitution offered the flexibility for the maximization of scholarly output. Never in history had learned leisure been so incarnated in a constitutional document. In subordinating study to the end of salvation of souls, the constitution of the friars more efficaciously promoted academic work than any other system dedicated to learning as a primary end. The zealous animarum drove the educational project of the friars. It gave them an end in view, a mark that exceeded research for its own sake, the attenuated object of so many scholars today. It enabled learning in a community dedicated to this further goal and scaffolded the search for wisdom in the raiment of virtue and holiness. It is no wonder it was and indeed remains irresistible to young men of quality and intellect. It drew Thomas like a moth to a flame. The governance of the order was created in such a way to identify and promote those who could most effectively achieve the ends of the order. Such students and masters were given special consideration. They were given time and space to study and to mature. It is for this reason I interpret the constitutions in a different way than most have in the past. In the early 20th century, there was a debate as to whether they were autocratic or democratic. In truth, they had elements of both. Yet I propose a third interpretation. I contend the orders produce something closer to the Aristotelian ideal of aristocracy than nearly anything else in history. It is a pure aristocracy of merits. By demonstrated intelligence, application, and effort, a Dominican student, no matter what their origin, could receive the best education that could then be obtained. There were far more opportunities in the order than among any other group. Students who excelled would become masters, able to become heads of their own schools in the, as the convents of the order proliferated. They received extensive privileges, unthinkable in any of the other religious orders and impossible in any secular occupation. This derived from the fundamental Dominican practice of exemptions. The superior could dispense a friar from nearly everything that did not fall under divine or natural law. The purpose of such exemptions was to serve the ends, the salvation of souls through the means of study. The latitude was extraordinary and required administrators of rare prudence and foresight. An accomplished professor could be excused from nearly all choral duties, from the community solemn mass, even from attendance at meals. This left an impressive amount of time for those who could employ it most productively, as Thomas certainly did. He was never burdened with the offices of administration at any point in his career. In humble recognition of his strengths and weaknesses, he refused two exceptional promotions to the Abbacy of Monte Cassino and to the Sea of Naples. In one of the only recorded instances of Thomas being irritated, he snapped at Brother Reginald when the latter suggested that he would receive a red hat at the upcoming Council of Lyon. Thomas tartly, called, tartly told his socius, I am unable to be more of use in the order than the position I currently hold. That shut him down. As the friars knew, the offices of administration were unfriendly to the life of the mind. Rather, they were services of humility to those who were seeking deeper wisdom. Advanced academics were granted private quarters, and it appears that Thomas spent the majority of his time there, teaching and reading, dictating and writing. It was his oasis of solitude and silence, making possible the spectacular achievements that we benefit from today. He was appointed preacher general, not necessarily because of the quality of his sermons, but because the office was a sort of parallel and aristocratic authority 
that balanced the elected officials of the order. It allowed him private correspondence and an ex officio vote in the provincial chapters. One can see how delicate this all was. In the hands of lesser men, such freedom could be dangerous. It was the genius of the preachers that they were able to create a sort of school of prudence, as strange as that may sound, in which quality could be tested at numerous different levels in both academic and administrative offices. It was the Dominican order that created this possibility, enabling the Aristoi, the best, to rise like cream to the top. Dominic made Thomas possible, and Thomas made the Dominican life actual in its fullest sense. How many thinkers in history have had the privileges accorded to Thomas, the liberty founded in the evangelical councils, united to the freedom of learned leisure, all in unceasing service to the contemplation of the truth that sets us free. I wonder sometimes if we could say that Thomas Aquinas was one of the freest men who ever walked the earth. And yet, the end was nearing. The days were short. Thomas perhaps felt it at the close of his tumultuous second regency in 1272. It is both affecting and convicting to me as an academic, who is also perilously close to the half century mark, to confront the achievement of Thomas Aquinas. It is for me and not for, Shake, not for Thomas that Shakespeare can write, where art thou muse that thou forgets so long to speak of that which gives thee all thy might? Spend'st thou thy fury on some worthless song, darkening thy power to lend base subjects light? Return, forgetful muse, and straight redeem in numbers time so idly spent. Sing to the ear that doth thy lays esteem, and gives thy pen both skill and argument. How have I, as a professor, redeemed the time? How as a scholar? is a question we should all challenge ourselves with. Yet for Thomas, his prodigious output was beginning to affect him. Home in Naples, witnesses recounted his copious tears at the Latin Compline verse, do not cast us off in the time of our old age. His work begins to trail off as he approached the mystical experience that heralded his death. How well would he have understood Eliot's sentiment, in my end is my beginning, in my beginning is my end. He had been seeking this end from the time of his first childhood glimmers of rational thought. Steadfastly had he pursued the end that is the beginning of all things. Neither looking to the right or the left, his eyes remained fixed on the goal of all wisdom. He fulfilled the injunction of Sirach, festina tempus et memento finis. His intellectual life was the model of all pre-Cartesian thinkers. The initial posture is not one of doubt, but of trust. Trust in the senses, trust in reason, trust in divine revelation, trust in the compelling power of truth. Trust was the inescapable foundation upon which to build the empire of reason and to receive revelation. Thomas's entire existence was a fulfillment of the ideal of wisdom outlined by the philosopher himself. Not only did the Dominican attain intellectual virtue through a lifetime of proper ordering, he began rightly and progressed well. He lived out the preparatory prayer of the Dominican rite that he celebrated every day, asking that every one of our works may begin with thee and through thee be happily ended. How appropriate is the sentiment of Aristotle when applied to the life of Thomas. It is through wonder that men began to philosophize, wondering in the first place at obvious perplexities, and then by gradual progression raising questions about the greater matters. Thomas himself comments on this passage. Since philosophical investigation began with wonder, it must end in or arrive at the contrary of this. And this is to advance to the worthier view, as the common proverb agrees, which states that one must always advance to the better. At seven years old, Thomas peppered his exasperated Benedictine teachers with the repeated question, what is God? He had ascended the ladder of wisdom and love from that day until the one in which he found himself again lost in wonder at the great sea of being in his mystical experience in the chapel of San Nicolo in Naples. Far from all of his works being as straw, Thomas had merely advanced to the better. He had found his beginning in his end.
In light of all this, what can Thomas say to us today? I'm going to give you an unorthodox response, drawn not from the friars preachers, but from the order of friars minor, one in which St. Thomas would have concurred. On his deathbed, St. Francis, of all people to utter such a sentiment, on the cusp of his migration from this earthly light, said, let us begin, brothers. Let us begin to serve the Lord. For up to now, we have done little to nothing. Thank you. <laughs>